Hello, my name is Melody Glenn. I'm an EMS fellow at University of California, San Francisco, and this is our Academic Life and Emergency Medicine book club. Tonight, we are lucky to have the author, Kevin Hazard, here tonight to discuss our book, A Thousand Naked Strangers. Thank you, Kevin, for joining us. Thanks for having me. And everyone else could just do a qu quick introduction of who they are, where they're coming from. I guess I'll start. I'm Morgan. I'm coming from Christiana Care. It's in Newark, Delaware. Hi, I'm Leanne Wood. I'm coming from UT Southwestern in Dallas, Texas. Hi, my name's I don't know if I'm on. My name is Nicole Lawson. I'm uh, in LA County. I'm the assistant medical director of the EMS agency there. Hi, I'm Josh. I'm a sociology PhD student at UC Berkeley. Okay, great. And of course, our author, Kevin Hazard. Yes. Um, uh, <laughs> Um, Kevin Hazard, uh, and I live in uh, in LA as well. All right, we've got quite the the West Coast contingency here. I was going to say it makes more sense why it's Pacific time now. <laughs> <laughs> and for those of you watching who don't know, Kevin Hazard was a Grady paramedic, and Grady EMS and Grady Hospital is the big. EMS system, hospital-based EMS system in the county safety net hospital for Atlanta. So, uh, all right, we'll jump right into the questions. Nicole, if you want to start. Sure, thank you. First of all, Kevin, thank you so much for taking the time to share your experiences with us. Um, you know, at the beginning of the book, you really take the readers through your decision to become an EMT, and I was wondering what your motivations were um, working as an EMT to go to paramedic school. And this is that a different process for you? Yeah, you know, the, the an EMT is a it's it's a good way to get into it, and it's it's a fun start to your career. Um, but ultimately, uh, the paramedic is the one who's doing the majority of the work. Uh, the person who ultimately everybody has to answer to, um, and so you can only be an EMT for so long before you start to think, you know. I would, this is what I wanted, you know, I want to become a paramedic. I want to be the one uh, upon whose decisions the patient outcome rests. And so that was just sort of a natural progression for me. There are very few people who become uh, career EMTs uh, in EMS. That's generally more of a fire thing. Typically, um, in EMS, people move on to paramedic just because it's the, you know, it's, it's the person making the decisions. Yeah, so it sounds like that's a, you know, a natural step in a progression of a career. And actually, I was really struck by a reflection you had um, when you received a question from a clerk, uh, kind of a typical, tell me your, you know, the worst thing you've ever seen kind of question. And you, you write um, that being a medic is a job, it's something I do to make money. And, um, you know, I was always thinking about, you know, what are the barriers to paramedics and longevity and satisfaction, particularly in L.A. County, as we have a lot of paramedic turnover, and one of the things I've considered is the lack of adequate kind of avenues for growth in the profession. And first I was wondering, do you consider paramedicine a profession? It sounds like probably you do, but not in the sense of, you know, a, a job that requires a special certification, because then of course it is, but more in that um, abstract sense of something that, you know, becomes a part of you and, and provides you a, a sense of fulfillment or, um, you know, uh, you know, that kind of identity. And um, and then in addition, did you have, ex you know, any opportunities for growth as a paramedic? And do you feel like there was a limitation there? And did that contribute to your decision to kind of leave the profession? Yeah, you know, there are a lot of people who make a very long career out of EMS. And I think to a certain degree it depends partly on where you work. Um, L.A., New York, uh, Atlanta, Miami, the, the busier systems, they have a tendency to wear you out and people go to a fire service or um, 
you know, a quieter place, or they become a nurse, or they just get out of the field altogether. It's a tough thing to do because you are climbing in and out of an ambulance. You're climbing up and down stairs. You're, there's, there's always a fat guy who's pinched between his tub and his toilet, and you've got to drag him out on a hot, sweaty day. And that's not easy to do when you're 48, I would imagine. Um, so for most people, it does have an end line. Um, you, you, you know, and that's why people kind of transition to other forms of, of public safety or they, be, you know, they want to become a nurse. Um, it, it, is, it tends to be a very difficult thing. Uh, physically to do forever. For me, it, nursing was never an option. Becoming a PA was never an option. Um, you know, I had no intention of going all the way through medical school and becoming a doctor. Um, but you'd have to become a doctor in order to get the level of autonomy that you have as a paramedic. There's nobody else who is able to operate um, totally unfettered by anyone else who gets to make their own decisions um, who's, upon whose decision making a patient's outcome rests other than a doctor. And that's, you know, that's quite a leap to go from paramedic to doctor. It's a different world. You know, in a paramedic, you're in somebody's house. You're on the street. You're in the highway. You're in a, an abandoned building. You're in a federal penitentiary. Whereas as a doctor, you're in an emergency room or, or in an office. Um, so it's a totally different type of thing. And in EMS, once you become a paramedic, your kind of next option is to become a supervisor, which is essentially then the person who keeps charge of making sure that the paramedics show up on time and that they don't get in trouble and that if they have a car wreck, you, you know, you're you the one who winds up having to fill out that paperwork. So it's, it's a funny career field because you get into it very quickly, but once you reach it, unless you're in a fire-based service, which I know they have here in L.A. County, you, you find yourself, uh, you, you hit your ceiling relatively quickly. I think. Right, and I, I think one of the issues we have in LA County too that we see is that paramedics promote out of their uh, paramedic position. And so we can't, you know, have, we don't have as many long, uh, long-term paramedics that can offer kind of what you discussed at the end of your book, that real understanding and imparting of knowledge to the new paramedics that come in. And I, I, I completely agree, it seems like there that you really have to seek an alternate career uh, path that, that may be somewhat, you know, very different than the career path that leads you into paramedicine. And I think that that may be, you know, a fault of uh, how we, we approach it. It would be nice to see more ways to have paramedics continue kind of longer in, in different avenues and education roles and other things that, that we don't have in LA for sure. And I don't know if that exists elsewhere. Yeah, I know Atlanta did not have a, a strong uh, mentor program at, as far as that goes. You know, my, my father-in-law was, was drafted into the Army, and he went to Vietnam, and he used to joke about the fact that by the time they had any idea of what was happening around them, their tour was up, and they went home. And a new group of guys came in who were just as clueless as they were when they arrived. And he just imagined at a certain point, you know, or he realized at a certain point, this is it. The cycle just continues. And a new group of people are going to come in here, and they're not going to know who's who, and they won't know where they are. And they'll, they'll do exactly what we did, eventually realize the futility of where they are, and just start marking their time. I don't think EMS is, is quite uh, parallel to that. But you get, you get the, you know, it does convey the sense of eventually people build up all this wisdom, but they don't really have a great way to impart it unless you become a teacher or unless you're one of those people who sticks around until they're 55. It's really hard to pass what you've learned down on, you know, what you've learned down to other people. And if you think about a doctor, you know, they're, they have a residency program. You go through four years of medical school, and if you want to work in an ER, you have a three-year residency program. So it's three years to study under a doctor when you have already gone to medical school, when your base knowledge is greater than than any paramedics coming out of school, and yet you still have three years of practice under someone, whereas you get your paramedic license, and they're so eager to have that body that you get your numbers, and you're out the door, and you're on an ambulance uh, running a code that very afternoon. Um, you know, it's the the passing down of wisdom, I, I feel, is never is not something that the field has really done a great job with. Can I just follow up on that question? Um, sure. So, in your book, you talk a lot about your partners having a lot of turnover. Um, I also work as an EMT in the 911 system. I've only been there for about six months. There is high turnover in our company. And I'm wondering, both with paramedics and with EMTs, and I'm wondering if it's not necessarily an issue of people reaching kind of their 
plateau in terms of they can't realize their professional potential, but maybe has more to do with low wages, low prestige. And often the, the even in my EMT academy at the private EMS company that I work for, uh, you know, management even welcomed the job as being a stepping stone career. And often that's a phrase that's used, but this EMS is just a stepping stone into mainly for a lot of, at least for a lot of young men, it tends to be towards fire departments. Um, and then others seem to be interested in nursing and things like that. And where EMS is constantly framed as just being a stepping stone career. And I was wondering um, if you saw that in, in your work and if you have any opinions on that. Yeah, I did. And I found it very frustrating, as did a lot of other people who who really view EMS as, you know, sort of the tip of the spear for the healthcare system. A firefighter is a career. A cop is a career. To get hired in either one of those, you have to go through this long process. It's a lot of training. And j just to be hired is, is a long, slow process. Whereas you go through a few months at a community college and suddenly you're an EMT and you're on an ambulance, and anything that comes easily will, will be regarded as such. And uh, EMS has never done a very good job of branding itself. It has never done a very good job of getting its message out of who are we and why are we so important. If you turn on the news at any given day when there's been a car wreck, they'll say police, fire, and other emergency personnel. Well, those That amorphous other emergency personnel are the people who actually save lives, the, the ones that were, that were innovating patients and pushing drugs, doing CPR, uh, converting non-perfusing heart rhythms. Those were EMTs and paramedics who have been lumped into this other emergency personnel. And we've never done a very good job of, of counteracting the public's lack of knowledge of us. I mean, it's partly it's because, you know, cops have this long history in the U.S. Some negative, some positive. Firefighters have a long history in the U.S. Some, you know, goofy, the whole saving a cat. But for the most part, firefighters are really revered. Paramedics have just an integral role, and yet... Maybe it's because we're afraid of the doctor's office. Maybe it's just because it's fairly new. Um, but nobody really knows about it. People have no idea. Even in Atlanta, where Grady is such a stored institution, EMS is still this strange shadow organization, and it's hurt us. It's hurt our recruitment. It's hurt our retention. Um, it's hurt the way the field is presented. You know, EMS is a serious job, and it and we should be continuing to advance. But I feel like in most cities, it's hit something of a plateau. Uh, you, you know, you have, you now have the, a lot of places where the the PAs and uh, the uh, the nurse um, practitioners are beginning to get on ambulances and go out in the field because it's so expensive. You know, all these insurance issues that we have and hospital overcrowding. Paramedics should be playing a huge role in in bringing healthcare to the people as opposed to just bringing emergency care to the people. And yet somehow we're being sidestepped in our own specialty. And I think it all comes down to the public's lack of awareness, which is due to our own um, inability or ineffectiveness in getting the message out. I feel like I've seen not even just the public's lack of awareness, but within the medical profession, because you, I mean, I've heard even nurses call paramedics ambulance drivers, as in like <laughs> they're just driving the ambulance and not actually providing actual like medical care. And I think it's just a lack of exposure. And I don't know, I feel like ride alongs and things like that would be should be mandatory across the board if there's if possible throughout nursing training, PA training. I mean, we do it as residents, so um, I think it just would add to a lot of the the respect for what um, you know paramedics do. Yeah, it's it's stunning, um, and then you see that all the time. I had a, a a hospital transfer that I was I kind of got roped into one day. There was a guy who walked into Grady, which is a great hospital for a lot of things. It just at the time did not have a great cardiac care center. And, but they were partnered with Emory Healthcare, which is very well known, and they have a great cardiac, cardiac care center. So this guy walks through the door. He arrests literally as he's walking through the door. And so he's in this critical care bed, and they need to get him to Emory. And so they said, hey, can you go ahead and, and, and you know bring him over? And so uh, I'm the paramedic. I'm in the back of the ambulance. I'm, I'm the one who is pushing the drugs. I'm the one who's uh, monitoring his heart rate and shocking or doing whatever may need to be done, um, the one innovating this patient. And the nurse turned to me at one point and very pointedly said, uh, you know, it's funny the difference between EMS and nursing. Your job 
your focus is on rushing them here. Our focus is on figuring out what's wrong with them. And <laughs> I just wanted to push her out the back door because I thought, what a one, what a passive aggressive thing to say, like right in the middle. Of the, I mean, it's clearly a dig for whatever reason. But it was also shocking just how how little she understood how big a role that we played in and how much we went hand in hand. And um, you know, I, it does get back to perception. It does get back to what people are paid and how they're trained and. Um, for whatever reason, you know, some of it's self-induced. I mean, I had plenty of partners who did not take their job seriously and did a poor job. And when I showed up at a hospital, I was not only trying to convince um, a doctor to listen to me, but I was trying to convince a doctor that I was not the last person who came in and had done a crappy job. Um, so there are a lot of things that need to be taken care of, but um, it's, just, it's a strange soup that EMS finds itself in, and, you know, constantly having to fight that image of ambulance driver, um, it's, it's a little frustrating. Do you have any recommendations for how we can improve the relationship between the emergency department and the EMS? I, I've seen some systems that do it very well. I did a rotation at University of New Mexico and their paramedics and EMTs seem to have a very highly esteemed role, I think partially because of how rural most of the state is and they provide a large amount of, of the care. And they do a lot of community paramedicine as well and critical interventions in route to Albuquerque. And I also had a good rapport with the, with the doctors there at the attending. So they would go through some of the patients, they'd go through the cases, they'd do some bedside teaching. And I thought it was a fantastic relationship that I don't see at lots of other hospitals. Do you have any suggestions for people working in the emergency department where you can improve the relationship and why it's so important for, for both sides to be involved in this? Yeah, you know, where I worked, Grady was is a teaching hospital, so they have new residents that come in every July, but we also were hospital employees. Unlike most big cities, we weren't city employees, we weren't fire department employees. We worked for the hospital, and so we showed up in the morning, we showed up at the hospital, um, you know, we were able to train, take the same classes that the doctors and nurses took, um, you know, we had an innovation lab. We had all sorts of things that we could do, and because of that, and, and the, the doctors also, the, the residents uh, rode with us, and they would do rotations on the ambulance to get some feel for what it was that we were doing. And it created this relationship between us and them, and we got to know one another, and it built some level of understanding. Uh, I, I think you know, EMS needs to do a good job of delivering patients um, intelligently. You know, you need to have people who not only deliver the right care, but then can walk through the door and present their patient in, in a way that, in a coherent manner, and show that they know what they're doing. So some of it is, is definitely on us in terms of training. I think a lot of it comes down to a rapport built between the doctors and the medics. Um, and that, I think, is the biggest thing, is trying to connect your EMS service with your hospital and, and that interaction because everybody's busy. Nobody has a ton of time, um, but the more we know each other, the more we can begin to understand the differences. You know, I, I can remember a number of cases where you would come in and someone would say, well, this patient doesn't have a line and they would get sort of aggravated and you, you know, you wouldn't necessarily even have time to say, well, he was hit by a car three blocks away. I thought perhaps it was more important to hurry him in to a place where he could get a surgical intervention than it was to sit around in the middle of the street and start two big 16s on him. So, uh, but the notion that, that like, why haven't you started a line? And then you would have somebody ride with you for a shift and they would go, oh my God. You know, I, have a, I have a good friend who was, who was a charge nurse at Grady. She went on to become a nurse practitioner. She rode in the ambulance with me one day and was stunned at how hard it was to operate within the confines of, of an ambulance. Uh, at the same time, Grady had a great program where they allowed paramedics to come and work in the ER. And it provided us a totally different view of, of what it's like to have a patient for nine hours as opposed to 34 minutes. Uh, you get a completely different perspective on what people inside the ER are going through. Um, so I think that's a huge part of it, is that interaction. In the book, you also allude to a lot of the interactions between fire and police. Uh, I was just curious, what do you think makes the, the strain on that relationship a lot? It, it seems that it, it happens pretty frequently that the relationship is not what you would expect it to be. Yeah, you know, we're, it's, it's, a, it's sort of a sibling situation. You are inextricably linked to these people, 
Um, you have no choice but to deal with them every single day, and for the most part, you have a ton in common. But ultimately, your goals are different. You know, particularly for the police, if they arrest a guy, and we we spend all day with the cops, right? Every time you run a wreck, every time you run a shooting, assault, stabbing, um, every time that somebody's dead, the cops are there, and so you wind up speaking with them, you get to know them, so you have a certain relationship with them, and yet. If they have somebody in custody who's been pepper sprayed and they call you out, their intention is, hey, just check him out and make sure he's good to go to jail. And essentially with that, you know, the subtext is, I want you to assume medical responsibility for this guy so that if he dies in, in jail in three hours, I can say, hey, Grady checked him out. What do you want me to say? And it would cause a lot of um, friction between us when we'd say, you know, uh, you pepper sprayed him, and he says he's got asthma, and though he looks fine now, he might not be later. Um, or somebody who got, you know, walloped in the head, he might look okay right now, but does that mean that he doesn't have a brain bleed and isn't going to be posturing in your jail cell in, in you know, 40 minutes? I, I can't answer that question. He probably should come to us. And because of that, it, it definitely caused a lot of, um, a lot of friction, and, and fire was kind of similar. In Atlanta, the fire department does not transport. So a lot of the people, reasonably so, are in that job to fight fire, not necessarily to run medical calls. And, you know, we had a lot of great fire medics, a lot of guys who were really good at their job, who the moment they showed up, you knew, okay, things just got better. But there were guys who just didn't want to be there. And, you know, I, I remember one arrest in particular that we were working. This fire captain poked his head in the door and said, you guys got it? Can we cancel? Um, I mean, what it was we were stunned that, that they were just gonna they were just gonna turn around and leave. Um, and you you know you get that with uh, with services that don't transport. And so you know again, it's just it, it was very much a sibling situation where we have everything to do with each other, and yet you know we're all operating at a totally different um, a totally different frequency. I feel like I've seen that happen a lot with the psychiatric patients as well. The police will have a psych patient and they don't want to necessarily take them to the hospital so they call the ambulance to transport them when it's not really necessary. But I think that goes back to our sort of inappropriate handling of psychiatric patients in general in society. Mm -hmm. No one really knows what, what, to, what to do with them. Um, yeah, I mean, that's no secret. Our, psychiatric situation that we have here has really gotten out of control. We have, there's no level of care for them. You know, Atlanta has this um, has a mobile psych team that comes out and they, they make sure that people are on their meds and they evaluate and they talk with them and they just kind of get some grasp of their living situation. But if they go off their meds, they have no choice but to call us because they have, there's nothing they can do with them. And then, God forbid, a psychiatric patient be 17. Then you're really in trouble. Because now nobody knows what to do. Nobody wants them. The pediatric facilities don't want any part of this. They hear that medication on there like, whoa, 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 no, he's not ours. Um, and, of course, the, the adult facilities, the last thing they want is a 15-year-old in their inpatient psych ward. So, it's, yeah. it's And then there are just the, the big homeless guys that are sitting there that are sitting on the corner talking to the stop sign that sort of make everybody slightly uncomfortable. But... Should he be there? Probably not. Should he be in the hospital? Also, probably not. So what do you, you know, it, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's psych is definitely a catch-22. Kevin, I'm wondering if you can speak to uh, the reverse as well in terms of those tensions with police. Um, what you described sounds a bit like, you know, these overwhelmed, well, it sounds like these different public services are kind of competing over bodies. It sounds like the ambulance is trying to pull people into the hospital, whereas the police are trying to pull people into the jail. But it seems like, at least here in California, what I see a lot of as an ethnographer, is it seems to see a lot of the reverse, that you have these overwhelmed public services that don't necessarily want to compete to pull bodies into their own respective endpoints, but instead to push them the other direction. So we get that a lot with, like, involuntary psychiatric holds that police put on hold, where it seems like maybe these people should be going to jail, given some of the conduct that they're conducting on street, but, you know, cops will cut some paperwork to put them on involuntary psych hold, which pushes them into the ambulance. Or when somebody's kind of ETOH or they're intoxicated, it could be a case of public drunkenness where police could arrest them, but instead they try to medicalize the case and we'll call the ambulance out. And I'm wondering, if, I assume you've seen this tension too, and I'm wondering if you see one tension playing out more than the other, this kind of shifting of burden that I'm describing or this kind of 
encroachment or competition that you seem to describe this earlier? No, you, you, there's definitely both. Um, there are plenty of cases where the cops just want to get this person off their hands, and it's a violent patient. You know, meth is a big thing in Georgia, and so you get a kid who's really high on meth, and the cops didn't want to have to deal with him, so they would try to dump him on us. Well, you take a 175-pound man, and you give him a head full of meth, and then you let him loose with two paramedics, like, they're in trouble. Um, we don't have, you know, we have soft restraints and, and Haldol and Versed, not always super effective against a guy who's, you know, on the tail end of a 48-hour meth binge. Um, and so you have plenty of that. You also would have, you know, plenty of instances where there might be a wreck and a medic would say, oh, no, they're fine. Just go ahead and, you know, you, you take that guy. He was... He was, he was drunk, you go ahead and deal with him, whereas they probably should have taken him to the hospital. I, was, I guess I was referring more to an instance in which um, police were using EMS as a way to uh, uh, take the, um, the burden of responsibility for this patient off themselves, to be able to say, hey, hey, Alex checked him out, they said he was great. Uh, but there was definitely a sloughing off in both directions. You know, we would show up at the hospital with a psych patient or a homeless guy, and as soon as he walked through the door, the doctors, and you... You, you know, you feel for the doctors. They would look at you and say, we just discharged her 30 minutes ago. She's been here four times this week. I know she has a prolapse rectum, but there's nothing we can do for her at the moment. Like, we've already dealt with it. They, you, what are we supposed to do? But the cops don't want to deal with her because she's sitting in front of a gas station, and the gas station keeps calling 911. Uh, so you, you have a ton of that. You know, homelessness usually is at, at the center of it, um, and then this certain amount of recidivism that, that gets into the mix with, with police just looking to, you know, toss somebody back in the city lockup um, and trying to get you to sign off on it. These transport decisions, um, you know, they're about patient safety and what's the best decision, you know, for the patient to go to the hospital, to go with police, um, but also, you know, things that we struggle with, and I'm sure that you, it sounds like you dealt with this a lot in the book, was, you know, provider safety and, and what's the safest way to transport that patient, both for the patient and for the providers involved. You know, putting a very violent patient in the back, an ambulance unrestrained, are they going to, you know, assault providers? Are they going to escape from the back of the ambulance versus putting them in a police car um, despite the fact that they need medical attention? And those decisions are, are kind of difficult to deal with. And as far as provider safety, do, I mean, do you feel like the agency that you worked with did enough to pr protect you and, and set you up for, you know, to be safe in, in the job, or are there other things that one could do to, to keep the provider safe? I mean, it's an inherently dangerous job, so to a certain degree, you are just going to have to accept the fact that you're, you're going to be with dangerous patients. Um, I knew great big guys that worked. I knew tiny women that worked. Um, you know, everybody had the same degree of reservation with dealing with a violent patient because, you know, four or five times a year you find yourself in a full-blown fist fight um, and you wonder, how did this happen? You know, I didn't, I didn't see this coming ten minutes ago. Um, and so everybody had the same degree of, of reservation. The only thing, I would say the main thing that, that I did not see in Atlanta and it might be different elsewhere was at no point did anyone ever our radios were never synced, I guess you could say, with our emergency button. So there's a there's a panic button, basically, in the top of your radio. When you push it, it sends out a tone that says, this person's in trouble. But the tone was never synced with the radio. And nobody ever knew who had which radio. So if I'm getting beaten up and I push my panic button, they have to stop everybody and essentially do a roll call of all 25 units to try to figure out who's doing this. And if I'm the 22nd unit called and the 21 before me have answered at varying intervals, someone, you know, they, they'll call somebody two or three times before they move on to the next number. So it could take five or six minutes for them to say, hey, Kevin, are you okay? Um, in which time, who knows what's happened. And that, that was always mystifying to me, that, that post 9-11, the biggest finding that they came out with was that EMS, police, fire, port authority, they were all completely incapable of speaking to each other. Everybody had a different radio frequency. They were using different 10 codes. There was no intercommunication, and it was a complete cluster. 
that was supposed to be fixed. In fact, tons of federal money was sent specifically to fix the radios, and a lot of the federal money went to buying strange gadgets that I never really saw anybody use, um, as opposed to a very simple thing where if I push my radio button, they should immediately know, hey, that's Kevin Hazard, and he's at 2211 Simpson Road, so somebody needs to get over there. But, and that never happened. That th that was mystifying to me that that I could push a panic button and no one ha would have any idea who'd done it. Especially with the level of sophistication of our smartphones, right? I mean, Google always I, knows where you're located. I know. In, in two seconds, you could call an Uber or <laughs> order a pizza, but nobody has any idea where a 911 caller is. And that's another, you know, th that they John Oliver just did a great thing on that the other day where he was talking about the fact that Uber can tell where you are, Papa John's can tell you where you are, but if you call 911 and you don't have an exact fix, you're out of luck. And that, you know, we used to joke all the time about, you know, that that someday somebody famous is going to die because they're sitting right where, they're sitting two blocks from where they said they were and nobody has any idea. Um, it was just, it's very bizarre that somehow, uh, as well as we can, zone in on a cell phone. I mean, you use Uber, or, or excuse me, you use Waze. I mean, they, I mean, they know where you are down to 10 feet. How does Waze know more than our national 911 system? It's, it blows your mind. I also love the description of the disaster training scenario that you did. Because <laughs> I feel like so many different places that would be the exact same situation. And then I love how it just sort of fizzled out at the end with no real changes yeah. or... You know, they, they could check the box that had been done. Yeah, yeah you guys I think did that's the a training. Big problem in medical field. Yeah, yeah, and we in uh, medical education burnout is a very big theme right now, a very popular thing to discuss, but it also seems very elusive to figure out the strategies to fix it. I imagine it's the same in the pre-hospital scenarios. Do you have any suggestions? for think, systemic fixes to reduce burnout? It's tough because some of the things that I think a lot of people in EMS feel would fix it, hey, if we had more respect, if we had more money, we'd have less burnout. Clearly not true because doctors have a higher burnout rate than any job in the country and emergency room doctors have a higher burnout rate than any other doctor. So clearly those things are not a corollary. Um, and at the same time, I don't see the way that we're going right now. I, don't, I, don't, I can't envision a way in which we would change the emergency medical system. If you say that you have chest pain, um, even if everybody knows it's not chest pain, we aren't going to reach a point where they say, you know, you've been here three times a day, just go home. It's very rare that somebody gets kicked out of the ER. I mean, we see it. You know, you do see it, you, but it's super rare, and you almost have to be obnoxiously wrong to get kicked out because uh, to me I think that's the biggest thing it's the the overload of, of patients it's just the number of you know if we worked a 13 hour shift you know you'd run nine or ten calls each call takes about an hour um, and that's just a lot of constant moving and you know it, it wears you down and then you know the paperwork and and while you're in the hospital, they're saying, hey, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. There's someone having an asthma attack down the street. you got to go, go, go. That, that work volume is never going to change. So I don't know. It's a, it's a tough thing. I, I feel, at least in, in the EMS side, um, that a big part was recruitment. Uh, there were a lot of people who entered into the field who thought it was going to be you know, a lot more Wild West gunslinging than it was. And you have to be, you have to be just as content sitting down with a little old lady in her house, you know, who's dizzy as you are with the, the six patient shoot em up. Um, and if you're not, then you're really going to be unhappy. And I, I've heard doctors kind of talk about something similar in that, you know, EMS or ER doctors are, have been a specialty since, what, 79, 80? The field is sort of still new, not exactly certain of what it is, and so therefore not exactly certain of who it needs. Um, I think that's a big part of it is finding the right temperament. Uh, for the people, because the ones who are great, you know, there's a, there is a model to that type of person. It's not a direct correlation, but if you look at the people who join the army versus the people who eventually make their way to like, the special forces, there's a different approach. There's this sort of anti-authoritarianism. 
the strange humor, um, just their the, a totally darker, different outlook to life, and they they seem to thrive in chaos and to be more improvised. You know, they're they're jazz as opposed to blues, and I feel emergency medicine is the exact same way. That same personality is what succeeds. A follow-up question to the burnout stuff. Um, so would you think more crews on the street would have an effect on this? Because like in Alameda County, for example, which has a private EMS system, at the peak hour of the day, there's 45 ambulances on the street. And that's for a county of one point, almost 1 1.6 million people. And of course, that's never actually 45 units available because they're transporting and they're at the hospital and they're still trying to clear. And I'm wondering, when you, in, mu in much of the literature, when there's discussions of burnout, there's always this discussion of like post-traumatic stress disorder, all the stuff about schism, and all these things about the really stressful calls. But you were just describing basically the day-to-day -day grind that seems to wear you down. And it seems the solution almost seems somewhat obvious to me, which is just, or at least a potential, you know, maybe not the solution, but a significant prescription seems to be more crews on the street, more money being funded into EMS, and I'm wondering, do you think that might have an effect on on provider burnout? Yeah, I mean, if you're running four calls a day as opposed to eight, it seems like that would certainly help you out. Um, and you know, you obviously you're never going to slow down the volume. You know, those patients are going to going to continue to call on one. They're going to continue to flood into the ER. We're all going to have to continue to deal with that. Um, if if you can increase the number of people that are that are involved, then it seems an automatic that you would make people happier. And yet, you know, I've been to some smaller places where, or I've I've interacted with guys that work in a, you know, a tiny little municipality out in the middle of nowhere, and they're probably happier. But when they catch a call that they don't feel is worth their time, they're still just as quick to say, "Oh man, this is bullshit." Um, they get fewer of those, so they're probably happier. But I think that's a big part of what chews up so many emergency medical providers of of all levels is you spend so much of your time with people who don't truly need um, either a paramedic, a nurse, or a doctor. You begin to wonder, what am I, <laughs> what on earth am I doing? And I think that's that's as big an issue as the volume. You mentioned towards the end of the book talking to your wife and that conversation being kind of tipping point of or the last straw of um, realizing that you are uh, completing your career and being paramedic. Um, as you were going through the process, were there specific incidences, encounters, or interactions that you had that really you were made you cognizant that you were burning out, or did that kind of just come on to the end? No, there were a handful of um, handful of moments that. I remember thinking, um, you know, I'm not, I, I have a different approach than I did a year ago. I, I remember working with some new people and they would laugh at times when I wouldn't, when I would be very frustrated. Um, they would, they had a sense of wonder when that had, you know, that had worn away from me. And some of that is inevitable. You know, you do something for a long time, it no longer has the same magic as it did when you were brand new and you were seeing it for the very first time and it was it was exciting and then and there were dragons everywhere. Um, but I think my approach to, you know, to a certain degree my, my empathy began to wear down. Um, I, I never, I don't know, maybe I'm a sociopath, I don't know. I, the really sick people never really, I didn't get super affected by that. Um, you know, there were some really sad moments, and I hated to have to look at a parent and say, I'm sorry, there's nothing you can do to save your child. Those are gutting moments. But I don't feel like I carried that with me as much as I carried um, the frustration of, of all the other things, of, of the really difficult people, um, of the people who made their own lives difficult, thereby making my own life difficult. And I found over time that I had those things begin to frustrate me more. And then, you know, there's a whole... There's a whole socioeconomic aspect to emergency medicine, whether it's uh, the type of decisions that you make um, or the fact that, okay, I can't afford a private care doctor. I don't have insurance, so I'm just going to use the hospital. You know, heavy drinkers, chronic drug users, people who um, quite happily put themselves into a violent situation 
and then sort of expect somebody else to clean up the mess, that can be frustrating, as can uh, a guy who has dialysis and, you know, sometimes can't afford the bus ride, and so he skips dialysis two or three days in a row and then wonders why he's hyperkalemic and, you know, calls you really worked up at two in the morning. Um, you have to have patience with people like that. You know, somebody, you know, people from, from a bad neighborhood, people without the means to, to get themselves proper care, they deserve the same care as, as people who aren't in that situation. And But those are the very ones that you deal with the most. So the ones that whose sort of self-inflicted issues you just have less and less patience for if you're not careful. And, and I certainly noticed that I was starting to lean toward that. And I just didn't want to be one of those angry, bitter people. You know, there's I don't know that there's any job that pays well enough to to wake up every day really unhappy for. It sounds like maybe a better target for additional resources to prevent burnout in paramedics would actually be creating more resources for the patients that really don't need the emergency service such that the emergency service would spend more time doing what they think validates you know, the position of being a, a paramedic. Um, you know, one other thing I noticed was, at least what I took away in the book, was that the mood, your mood seemed to oscillate depending on, you know, a steady partner that you had that kind of was somebody you could, um, you know, uh, feel that was a, a friend and a partner with you in, in what you were experiencing rather than kind of the cyclic, uh, newbie or um, you know burned out uh, person that you were stuck with and you know some EMS systems do a better job than others and, and certain structures do a better job of keeping partners together how important do you think that is as far as your um, satisfaction you know, having that steady partner oh I think it's critical um, you, you know I've, I've always described EMS as imagine going on a 12-hour road trip with a perfect stranger now Imagine that once an hour you have to stop and get out and complete a task together. That's basically what the job is. But imagine if you really didn't like that person. And every day for 12 hours you had to go on this long road trip and six times a day you'd have to jump out and complete some really difficult tasks. That just sounds like a horrible job. That's what it is. Um, when it's somebody you get along with and, and, and you, even if you have nothing in common, I mean, I... And I'm a I'm a white kid from the Northeast. I work with plenty of black women from the Southeast. We we do we come from totally different worlds, and yet we we got along great, and we had tons of fun together because we were similar personalities. The same things made us laugh. If you don't have that with someone, there's somebody you just can't get along. I mean, if you put a I would suppose today if if you put a Clinton supporter with a Trump supporter in an ambulance, they would be supremely unhappy. Um, and that's essentially that to me that was a huge part of what made the job worthwhile or not was um, you know, do I have to spend 13 hours with somebody that I just don't get along with, who I have nothing in common with, uh, who's just going to make me grind my teeth all day long. Um, and you know, we, where I worked, they, they had this tendency to change the scheduling up all the time. And so it was you were constantly having to bid for these new shifts, and so you were working different times, and you had different partners. And you know, I had this one woman that I worked with for a long time who's divorced, and she had this she had a, uh, a custody situation like that. And every time they changed her schedule, she had to go back to court. I and mean, imagine how, imagine that. You have to go back to court twice a year to say, I need to work out my custody thing, especially with somebody who you probably don't get along with. You know, this, this is your ex after all. You guys probably don't have the greatest relationship. And you're having to go back in, constantly trying to renegotiate the terms of your own divorce. Uh, that would be horrible. Um, and that's, she went through that all the time. Um, and it, a lot of that seemed to be done without any great regard to what it would do to the people working. And I certainly had the most fun when I was with somebody that I got along with, um, you know, that, that made me laugh. And so that, that, to me, is a huge, huge part of it. Why did you decide to write this book? And do you think that writing it helped you process? I mean, each, each chapter and each clinical vignette seemed to have a different theme uh, that... I really resonated with, and I wonder if you didn't even notice that you sort of had that stuff swimming around in your head until you started writing, or what was your motive, and did it help you process some of the, the difficulties that you went through? I never wanted to write this book. Um, people kept saying, and it's one of those things I heard over and over again, uh, people saying, um, 
you know, I just wish somebody would tell this story the way it actually is. And there's this, there's a, there's a Coen Brothers aspect to EMS. There's this dark humor. Nothing had ever had the humor, you know. Everything was just overly wrought, stupid hero thing that just never made any sense to anyone who's ever done the job. I mean, if you've ever worked in any branch of medicine, you know that nobody ever slams on a patient's chest and goes, no, you're not going to die tonight. Like, nobody nobody does that. If you die, you die. It's not our fault. You know, we're not the one who shot you. Um, so I wanted I wanted to – that that humor wasn't there. And we all talked about it and talked about it and talked about it. And so finally one day I said, well, maybe I'll just take – I'll just write – a little blog and I'll see what happens and that's what I did I did a blog and people just started reading it and the response was great and I thought okay maybe there's something here the funny thing was I had no idea I thought I had nothing I thought I had no layover from this job that I did for 10 years which is which is if, when I think about it now how silly I'd, I'd gone through this extraordinary experience I entered into it at 24 or 25 very inexperienced in the world I got out of it at you know 30 I must have been 26. I got out of it at about 36. You know, this formative decade of my life where I had, I mean, it was, you know, I delivered babies and, and uh, told families that somebody was dead. And, you know, I found a heart on the highway and, and I saw people get shot and I, I helped people. And I had these incredible conversations with perfect strangers. And it was just to think that I could have thought, oh, I walked away from all that without it leaving some strange dent in my mind is really shows how little most of us want to think about what's going on inside our own heads. But sitting down to write it, I had no idea what that last chapter would be. I didn't I didn't know. I thought I would just say, and one day I quit. And it didn't occur to me. Luckily, that it had been gone just long enough when I started writing to begin to realize that, you know, there was, there was a journey here. And, um, I, you know, it had left this lasting impression. And um, there were a lot of, a lot of frustrations and, um, you know, the, all the stuff about me being a brand new paramedic, I think I had buried that, that fear and anxiety, that, that horrible sensation of today's day I'm, I'm going to be found out. Everyone's going to realize that I'm a fraud, that I'm, I'm, I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't have this paramedic patch on. I should be fired. I should be sent home. And I can remember someone saying to me at one point, they pulled out this long EKG strip and showed it to me and they said, man, when's the last time you saw that? And I was brand new and I remember thinking, holy shit, I don't even know what that is. And that's just something you never want to admit in the moment simply because you can't. But I didn't realize that we all went through it. And it wasn't until I wrote it and other people started to read it. So my like, God, I, I had the same thing. And I kept hanging out with you because I thought maybe you were going to give me the answers. Um, so, yeah, it was very cathartic. And I think even reading it for, for people, a lot of people in the field who have contacted me, it's clear that, that they've had the same experience with it. So it's, it's been very interesting in that regard. I feel like we're, we're uh, hitting our time frame here, but any last questions? I have one quick one. Uh, I'm just wondering if you have any advice for my current paramedic students. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think the, the, the piece of advice that I was given by my partner who said, um, know your protocols, don't second guess yourself, never let them see a sweat, that is – the heart of, I think, being good at any job, but really zeroing in and it, making it a career, making it something it's not just a job is a really difficult thing to do. Um, being a paramedic is a hard job. And so, you know, knowing what you're doing when you come out and having some concept and, and that from that will come confidence and from confidence will come good patient care. And then I think one of the biggest things is to understand that it is equally about providing comfort as it is about, you know, crazy, exciting medicine. And to be open to people who have nothing in common with you, whose lives you are quite convinced are being lived wrong, and be able to try to see things from their perspective. You're going to, you are inevitably will walk into a tiny, sweaty, dirty, roach infested apartment in some horrible part of town. And have to deal with someone who's being very difficult and who you think, like, you know, how are you living this way? But that person has a point of view. That person has a perspective. Um, and if you can figure out what it is, then you can at least begin to understand them. And if you begin to understand them, then suddenly a relationship forms. And now there's something that you can work with. And, and just that patience with people is huge. And then, of course, just 
the uh, the fact that you you have to be able to laugh at a lot of this stuff because it's <laughs> it's such a crazy world, but um, it's definitely something that you have to take time to you know process in a positive way too. If you laugh to stop from crying. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it was a great privilege to have you here with us as we're discussing your work. Wish we could even have you even longer because I think we all have even more questions we'd like to bring up. But um, thank you very much and thanks to everyone else for joining. Thank you very much. Thank you guys. I really appreciate it. I really do. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. All right. The broadcast and the blog post should be up within a couple of weeks. And I'll send out a link to everyone. Awesome. Thanks, right. guys. Thank you. Thank you.